<laughs> that way in the club. <laughs> One of my favorite characters. You mean Muhammad? Movie. I'm sorry? I said Muhammad. Everyone Muhammad? Is, I don't okay. know Muhammad. <laughs> no, I, I haven't memorized that movie. There's too much, <laughs> too much swearing in the movie. My wife would let me watch it because they use the F bomb too many times. No, it's shocking. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. Okay, constructive perspective. Uh, practitioners must realize that each person constructs reality in, uh, in their own unique way. And this is one of the problems we're having right now, looking at all these mass shooters. There was a mass shooting in, in New Mexico, Hobbs and Hobbs, yesterday at somebody's, at a party, and three people were killed. Seven people were wounded in Hobbs, New Mexico. That's way down in the corner on the Texas border. It's over by El Paso, strangely enough. Um, why would they do that? I mean, is their reality so much different than everybody else? Why would you, why would you uh, break the window of a, of a casino so that you could shoot down on a concert and just keep popping shots into, into this crowd of people, not knowing who you're shooting, not aiming your gun, just dropping rounds into, why would you do that? What kind of a world did he live in that that's normal behavior? Reality. Everybody's reality is different. And this is one of the things that we have to recognize. My reality is different from your reality. I'm 70, well, I'll be 70 in October. I keep saying I'm 70. I'm trying to get used to it. it it's it's, <laughs> it's going to hurt being 70 years old. So I'm trying to get used to being 70 years old. My reality is totally different from everybody else's. I was just talking about black and white television. That was my reality. When I first started watching television, there was no color television. We didn't know what color Bozo's nose was. Well, it's red, of course. Everybody knows that. But you guys get to see his red nose. And all we saw was this gray mass on, his, on the end of his nose. Was it really red? Well, we can only assume it was. We used to watch the Lucy show, Lucille Ball. Her hair was red. I was watching a movie last night where it was one of the first movies she ever made. Her hair is actually blonde in this movie. I know, it's not red at all. She dyed her hair red so that she would seem more unique. So she dyed her hair red. And it's very, very red. Of course, it's dyed red. So. so reality. Reality is different for everybody. It's different from, for all of you, depending on what your experiences are. Your reality is completely different than, than the next person coming around. Now, the assumption is that everybody's the same, that our realities are all the same. And this is one of the things that we keep hearing in the news. Or not in the news. The president keeps talking about fake news. What's he talking about? Why does he think that only one news agency is accurate and all the rest of them are inaccurate? Do you agree with him? I'm sorry? Do they agree with him? Do you agree with him? No, they agree with him. Oh, they agree with him. Yeah, exactly. They agree with him. What did he say yesterday? This, my wife emails. She emails me every time he says something really interesting. Uh, he said yesterday that uh, we are that the hurt, the number of hurricanes uh, hitting the United States has increased uh, in, in the last 10 years. And he says the way to stop a hurricane is to drop an atomic bomb in the middle of it. Oh my God! You think I'm kidding? He said that. No. Well, he's a stable genius. He also said that. That he's a stable genius. He just automatically knows things. It's it's part of his his brilliance. So I know. So his reality is completely different. Well, my, I, I've been around nuclear weapons, okay? I know how much destruction that they can do. They used to t tell us about this all the time. We, I was in the Air Force, so the Air, and the Air Force were the ones with most of the nuclear weapons. So we knew about these things. We were taught about these things. And I know that if you drop a nuclear weapon anywhere, that it's going to contaminate the atmosphere. We've only dropped, well, we've, we've dropped, actually, a relatively large number. But we've contaminated the environment that we dropped them on. So you can't, can't really do that. You can't really drop a 
I titled Bob on her, and uh, it would work anyway. Constructivism focuses on, on how the individual describes their experiences in terms of personal constructs. If I'm naturally paranoid, if I'm naturally anxious all the time, then my reality is going to be completely different than somebody else's. My grandson has to be the happiest baby I've ever been around. The kid never cried, uh, didn't mind having a wet diaper, uh, used to fill up his diaper and, and he would cry. Uh, happiest baby we ever, I have, I've ever met. But every once in a while, when he was asleep, he'd have a bad dream and he'd start crying. It's the only time he ever cried. He didn't cry to get this, he didn't cry to get that, but he cried during, uh, in, when he was dreaming sometimes. Uh, over, he's seven years old now, so he's not a baby anymore. Despite the fact I want to call him a baby, my daughter won't let me because she's afraid he'll act like a baby. If I can call him a baby, he knows my baby. Uh, but over, over the holiday, and I was already telling uh, the, the last class that uh, his, uh, one of his, his other grandmother let him watch a movie about murder, and he saw he saw a, a, an individual sneak into a farmhouse and murder people. Well, I live in a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. They're out in the middle of a cornfield. I mean, it's like the most isolated thing that you can possibly imagine. And he thinks, he, because he watched that movie, it became part of his reality, and he thinks that he's going to be murdered by somebody sneaking in the door. Because that's what happened in that movie. Now that has become part of his reality. So he's scared to, to sleep at, uh, at my house in the middle of nowhere, Lost Nation, Iowa. Lost Nation, who comes from Lost Nation? Well, about 456 people come from Lost Nation. But that's where I live, my, that's my reality. I live in Lost Nation, but he's afraid to go there. We have a dog that barks at things. There, we have foxes and raccoons and possums, and all kinds of things, and he barks all the time. But, uh, and we told him, well, you know, Moki will bark if, if somebody comes. You'll know it, and we'll be able to call the police, and they'll come out. Doesn't do, it, do, doesn't do him any good, because he saw that movie, and he saw exactly what happened. And now that has become part of his reality. So we're, we're going to go down and punch his other grandmother in the, in the face. <laughs> My wife wants to, to punch him out. Punch her out, I'm sorry. Anyway, so we all construct our own realities. And that's okay. It's, it's, it's the, what makes us all different. And that's fine. We all have our own reality. So my reality may be totally different than yours. I worked in medicine for, for 30 years. I worked in the morgue for 30 years. You guys have never e even touched what I, was, what I had to play with. It, didn't they? Wow. I did autopsies. So you guys wouldn't do that kind of stuff, would you? No, of course not. Most people wouldn't do autopsies, whether you're Navajo or whether you're not. Nobody wants to mess with dead bodies, but somebody's got to do it, and that was my reality. A personal, con a personal construct is an explanation of an event or series of events that becomes the lens through which the individual sees the world. So I saw the world from the point of view of a Hoosier, somebody from Indiana. <laughs> And, uh, of course, then uh, I'd never been on an airplane until I went uh, to basic training. And so we flew out to San Antonio, and then I went through basic training. And most of the people that were in my basic training unit were either from Missouri or they were from Indiana. Uh, the difference between Missouri and Indiana is like night and day. Uh, people from uh, Indiana are fairly um, liberal. Uh, people from Missouri are relatively conservative. People from Missouri have different ideas about African Americans. People from Indiana have more liberal ideas because we have lived with African Americans and, and they are just, they are, they are us as far as we're concerned. <clears throat> so it was really kind of interesting being in a, in a uh, with a group of racist Missourians and a group of relatively liberal people from Indiana. Uh, we had five guys in our, in our basic training unit that were African American. And they were, they were from uh, North Carolina. And these guys would gravitate toward us because we didn't treat them like, we didn't treat them poorly. So our, our construct, our personal constructs were completely different. And of course, as I uh, went through the military, uh, of course, you're around a lot of people who are, who are not the same as you. They're from different places. 
and you learn to get along. Everybody has to get along, otherwise somebody gets beat up, or somebody gets shot, or something happens. I mean, these are people with relatively high testosterone levels that uh, have to function together. Uh, so our, our uh, personal constructs had to mesh to some extent, because just because you were a racist when you are in Missouri, you can't be a racist when you're in the military. For one thing, there's a, there's a, a regulation against it. And for another thing, this guy is the person that's going to save your life if you're ever in that kind of a situation. These constructs are developed as individuals interpret them and give meaning to their experiences. Constructs are not consciously developed, they're just there. So that's the way it works. If you've ever been, if you've ever been to Egypt and ridden on a camel, no, if anybody's ever been to Egypt, I've been to Egypt. It was kind of fun, but I didn't get to ride a camel. Damn it. They stink. They smell horrible. <clears throat> uh, but then again, I think sheep and goats stink. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys live with your sheep and goats. <laughs> we used to live with our pigs, as stupid as that sounds. And pigs smell like humans, as weird as that sounds. Pigs uh, actually have pheromones that are very similar to human pheromones. So if you live on a pig farm, the, you're probably not going to produce a lot of young because the, the boars put off a lot of pheromones. And they put off so much pheromones that, that uh, it actually lowers your pheromone level. So men who, who uh, own a pig farm don't produce very many children. <clears throat> Obviously. I know, it's weird. <clears throat> it gets really strange. <laughs> Social constructivists uh, focus on how relationships, language, and context influence an individual's or a group's interpretation of self, others, and the world. And of course, we can see this in uh, somebody uh, is running for a city council someplace. And I didn't really look at this because it pissed me off so much. But he says that he need, they need to keep their city as white as possible because white people are better people than other people that aren't white. That's what he said. I know, I know, I know. I didn't read it, I didn't try to figure out where this <clears throat> jerk comes from. But one of the arch uh, racists in Congress is a guy from Sioux City, Iowa, unfortunately. He's a Republican. All the other representatives from Iowa are Democrats, and he's the only Republican. And he keeps saying really strange things about white supremacy, talking about white supremacy. And he comes from the same state that I live in right now. <clears throat> Again, his king is his last name. Anyway, so, um, there's a group inter interpretation of what's going on. So if you come from so select places, you guys all come from the, the reservation, or if you don't, you're at least you're Navajo, uh, you have those ideas in common. And of course, that's one of the reasons that Diné College is here. It's to teach you um, about your about your past. It's to teach you uh, traditions. And you'll either adhere to those traditions or you'll reject those traditions. If you're going to sit here, you're going to have to go all the way around. I'm sorry. I know. I put that in the way. Sorry. It's Henry's fault. He was early to class. He messed everything up. Personality is the individual's distinctive qualities, their traits, their characteristics, their behavior patterns. Personality is socially constructed. We have personalities. The, our personality was constructed by where we grew up. It's this, our society that creates our, our personalities. Without society, we, we would have no personalities. I have a brother that has suffer, suffers from PTSD. He was in Vietnam. Uh, he was a combat engineer in Vietnam. Some of the stuff that he did. I will tell you about some of the stuff that he did, but he blew, blew things up. Uh, he was a tunnel rat, which is the most god-awful job you could possibly imagine. They find a hole in the ground, uh, and somebody has to crawl into that hole and see if it's a tunnel system, and that's what my brother did. He was, he was little. We're not very big people. So they were looking for, I know, the football players didn't have to go. They didn't get to crawl into the tunnels. For one thing, Vietnamese are not very big people. And because we, are, we were small people, then my brother got to be a tunnel rat because he was about the same size 
as uh, Vietnamese. He only weighed about 110, 120 pounds. So he got to crawl into these holes, and you can imagine, what are we talking about? Oh, personality. Anyway, he developed PTSD okay. <laughs> during Vietnam. And he was okay for two or three, he was okay while he was in the military, while he, when he stayed, uh, when he was around other people that had experienced very similar things that he had experienced. <clears throat> and once he got out, uh, he worked for the state, uh, and once he retired from the state, now he lives alone, and he doesn't ever go anywhere. He doesn't live in society anymore. And he, if you talk to him, um, if he's around family members, all of a sudden he becomes a lot more effusive. But normally he just sits there and doesn't do a whole lot of love. He has lost his personality because he not, does not live in society. And if he is with select individuals, then he, he will demonstrate a personality. But the rest of the time, he's, I mean, the, when you first go to visit him, it's almost like talking to a rock because he doesn't react at all. He has lost his personality. He lives an isolated existence. He's like a hermit. He has his dog, and that's it, and his guns, which is a little scary. They're all, they're all World War II guns. He's got, a, he's got a, two Garand rifles, a, a carbine and an M1 uh, Garand rifle. Yeah, His two M1s. I, well, I don't know that, how nice that is. Because <laughs> uh, if hunters come onto our property, he threatens to shoot them. People stay away from him. Yes, sir? What is this, how does this relate to like people who um, <clears throat> Their personality will change depending on the context. On, setting. On, exactly. Sure, of course it does. It depends on this, the social situation. So if you go to McDonald's, your personality is one thing. If you go to a sit-down restaurant in, in Farmington, you go to Cracker Barrel and Gallup, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have to sit down. Uh, your personality is going to change. Your personality will change because the social structure has changed. That's normal then? That's normal, yeah, sure, of course it's normal. Because, you know, it's a social construct, your personality. <clears throat> and you wouldn't want to act the same way at Cracker Barrel that you act at McDonald's. For one thing, well, Cracker Barrel, the seats are, are better, are more comfortable. Uh, oh, jeez, it changed. Uh, they're different, and they want you to sit there longer. But at McDonald's, they're trying to get rid of them. They're trying to trying to get as many clientele as they possibly can get. So the seats aren't very comfortable. You're not going to sit around and, you know, talk a lot at McDonald's because it's too uncomfortable. <laughs> anyway, okay, so and we have to recognize this. We have to recognize that personalities are going to change. Now, this is really kind of interesting because if we are seeing a client, we are counselors, and if we're seeing a client, their personality is not going to be the same as it will be at home, because they're at the doctor's office, potentially, or they're at the counselor's office. So potentially, their clothes aren't the same as they would be at, uh, at, at uh, home. Maybe this is the first time they bathed all week. They smell okay now. They've changed their clothes. They have clean clothes on. If we, if we saw them in their house, they haven't changed their underwear in, in five days. They haven't washed their hair in five days, and you can <clears throat> smell it. Yes, sir. I, I've seen somebody, I've seen that, uh, uh, a guy I know, a friend of mine, and um, he's like real hairy, kind of like real hairy, and you know, like I, and I saw him, and he was going to the VA for counseling. And I just had lunch with him the day before, and I was giving him, a, came over to give him a ride to the VA, he right. was really clean cut, cleaned up, clean, and sure. And I. I asked him uh, if that's how he goes, and then he just said, the last time I got locked up. Oh, is that right? Because he smells so bad. Well, just he said I was a little too honest, because he, he's on a court order, he sure. has to go. And, yeah. So he's the last time I got locked up <laughs> on the fifth floor of VA. So he's there like, we go. Good now he wants to present a stable, normal, normal, normal kind of persona. Exactly. So, yeah. Which is very lo logical, very likely. Uh, if you see, if a doctor sees a client, if they see a patient, um, then usually the person has already bathed, they've already 
their personality changes completely. But you, if you see the same person in the emergency room, have you ever been in this situation? Yeah. If you see somebody in the emergency room, they're, they're completely different. So, and this is one of the problems of being in the emergency, or working in the emergency room. You see people at their worst because they, for one thing, they're injured. But for another thing, they haven't they haven't changed their clothes, and they don't then they don't smell nearly as good in the emergency room as they do in the doctor's office. And this is this can be a problem because the emergency room doctor sees this guy the way he actually is, and the doctor doesn't see him as he actually is. So the, the emergency room doctor will write this guy up. Just like your friend, you know, he uh, doesn't, he's not taking care of himself, uh, his hygiene is poor. Uh, that's what the emergency room doctor sees, but the doctor, when he sees him in his, in his office, he's cleaned, all, he's cleaned himself up. So he'll go, oh, this, this, this guy has no problem. I don't know what the emergency room doctor is talking about. He must be crazy, you know, that kind of stuff. The doctor must be crazy. Yeah, as interesting as all that stuff is. So we have to, we have to understand that what we see is what the, the client wants us to see. So, and it may not be a true uh, example of who they actually are. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to diagnose people from time to time. Because a lot of times they're not showing you who they actually are. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to diagnose somebody with borderline personality disorder. Border, people that are borderline uh, will put on, they will put on a persona, a specific persona. And so when you're around this individual, they act one way. When they're with everybody else, they act totally different. So what happens if you marry somebody with borderline personality disorder? This person is putting on an act, has been putting on an act for you the entire time you've been dating them. As soon as you marry them, their personality changes. I mean, it changes almost 180 degrees. All of a sudden, they're once they got you, a raving lunatic. Exactly, <laughs> they, they got you. They know they got you. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it's ugly. <clears throat> Talk about ugly. Some of our strongest personality <laughs> constructs are developed in childhood, and this is something that you need to understand. This is one of the reasons why. If you, t if you go into a counseling program and they don't talk about Freud, then you haven't gotten the whole story. Freud said that we develop all of our personality in our childhood. So most of our problems comes from what happened to us as children. As we get older, we get smarter. <clears throat> as we get older, we see the world differently than we did as a three-year-old. If something happened to you when you were three years old, then that's going to stay with you. As an adult, we're able to, to deal with this. We can deal with a lot of different circumstances because we have more resilience. We can think things out, but as a three-year-old, we can't. When we're around mom, mom is always perfect. Mom is always perfect no matter how imperfect she may happen to be. So whatever she does is the right thing. Moms are perfect. Dads are kind of perfect. But whoever takes care of you the most, that is the most perfect person in the world. And they always do the right thing as to, to a three-year-old. And if this is what happens to you when you're three years old, you think that that is normal. Because mom loves me. She says so. <clears throat> and she, she says it every day. Mom does because that's mom. Anyway, these constructs tend to be harder to change because they're based on immature feelings and possibly illogical thoughts and are established by an underdeveloped mind as truths. These are truths, and these truths will stick with this person for the rest of their lives, unless they seek counseling. And if they seek counseling and you do it properly, then you need to figure out where, where this problem came from. So you have to take them all the way back to their youth. And they will claim that the, this isn't a problem. Because this is true. This is reality as far as they're concerned. My mother is perfect. My mothers are always perfect. I, I read this morning that um, a lot of people who are uh, engaged in domestic violence, right. they were they had a lot of personal punishment when they were younger. Is that a crossover or is it more just... That's absolutely correct. We're going to talk about that in just a second. That is correct. That's the way it works. 
if uh, because that <laughs> that's the way it was done in their family, and their family's always right. Your family's always right. If your mom beat the holy hell out of you, then that was the correct way to raise a child. And potentially you will do the same thing. Even if you get uh, become involved with somebody that doesn't do that, you will try to, uh, if you uh, get yourself into a, a stressful situation, you'll revert back to, to hitting people. So as long as you can think about it, maybe you can talk yourself out of it. But if it's, if it's an automatic reaction, if this is a conditioned response that was conditioned when you were a child. As weird as that may seem. How do you break those kind of cycles? What we have to do is we have to, to tell that person this is what you're doing, and now as an adult, they can change. As an adult. But if nobody tells them that this was incorrect, that, that, that uh, they're reacting as somebody who this happened to as a child, then they'll never change. But if we can, and that's what counseling's all about, is taking them back to the, their, the source of their problem. And if we can take them back all the way to the source of the problem, if we can figure out what the source of their problem is, we can change their behavior in the future, in the present and in the future. That's what counseling's all about. So how, how powerful is, like, a mother or father talking to their, their son if they can say, like, we did this when you were younger, you know, we, we, were, uh, we were young or we didn't know any better, you know, we shouldn't have done this one. Well, then, then they're doing the counseling. Your parents are doing the counseling. They're telling you that they did something wrong. Most people have a difficult time saying, you know, I, was, I did the dumbest thing in the world. I say it all the time, but uh, that I, I shouldn't have done that when you, were, when you were a kid. People just don't do it. They assume that they're right. And potentially the reason they did it is because it happened to them when, when they were a child. It happened to them, yeah, when they were a child. And the reason that their parents did it was because that's what they were being told to do. This is how you, you have to spare the rod and spoil the child. I think that's in the, the Bible, if I'm not mistaken. Well, my good, goodness, that's that was orders from from way up above. So, I mean, who's going who's gonna to do something else, right? Spare the rod, spoil the child. We don't want a spoiled child, do we? So, of course, if you grow up in the wrong household or the right household, then that's what you do. Okay? <laughs> I know. This is sad, isn't it? Is that the same um, thing for, like, somebody who grows up to be a pedophile? Um, usually what happens with somebody who is a pedophile, uh, they were molested uh, at, at, at about that age, at the age that they're attracted to. Yeah, so if they were molested at age three, and it usually isn't like 18 month olds or something like that, because you don't remember anything when you're 18 months old, but when you were three years old, you, you have a memory of, of what was going on. So that, that becomes, condition for you. That's, that's what happened to you, therefore, you know, now, now suddenly you're attracted to three-year-olds. As, as you get older, you're attracted to three-year-olds. Did I tell you, is it in here that I told you the story that one of my colleagues, she was a tiny little thing, and she married this guy, that yeah, was in another class, so wasn't it? <laughs> she married this guy, and you know they, he was madly in love with her, and she was just this tiny little thing, flat-chested. Uh, she's only four foot eight. She was a baton twirler, as weird as that seems. I mean, how many people know baton twirlers? Anyway, so he marries this lady, and everything's going great. Everything's going great. Uh, she had a long nose, was, and she kept having surgery on her nose. <laughs> Not that that's important. So one day, one day she decides for her birthday she's going to give herself boobs. She's flat chested, so she decides to give herself, uh, you know, she enhances her breasts. And uh, she does it as a surprise for this guy. He's off somewhere on a, some kind of a, 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 a trip. And when he comes back, she's got breasts, and he just wails a tar out of her, just about kills her. And. Um, and, you know, and he apologized. He said it will never happen again. She finally recovers. She gets out of the hospital, and then he does it again. He beats her up. Uh, at that point, some smart cops uh, puts two and two together 
and uh, he thinks, well, you know, she was she looked like a kid before, and now she looks like an adult. Um, maybe there's something going on with this guy. So they started looking at at these business trips he was taking, and what they discovered was he was there were children being molested in these towns where he was going, and usually when somebody's being molested, they look at the most likely uh, perpetrator, and that's normally you know. Uh, Uncle Charlie, or somebody from you know the derelict that lives down by the by the uh, by the railroad tracks. You know they look at everything, but the the traveling salesman has wandered through town, <clears throat> and so they they realize that he had been molesting children. He was a pedophile, and the reason he married her, the reason he was madly in love with her, was because she looked like a child. He was attracted to eleven, uh, ten, eleven, twelve year olds. Uh, little girls, and uh, she looked like a 12-year-old, so, you know, <laughs> you got that look on your face. <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible story. She divorced the guy, he got put in prison, uh, and, and everybody lived happily ever after. <clears throat> So there we go. <laughs> kids nowadays, they dress very promiscuous, and parents are like encouraging it. And, sure. Like, definitely, there's a hand of, you know, pedophiles putting that I idea that kids dress promiscuous, I think. It's possible. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, I was uh, working in a clinic, uh, a pediatrics clinic in Virginia. And one of the people that worked there was a, was a young lady, and she had a daughter named Brittany. And this is when Brittany Spears first became popular. And she used to dance just like Brittany. And, I, and, and you know, that's okay for, you know, for Brittany Spears. She was 17 or 18 years old. But here's this little, you know, seven, five or six-year-old, and he, she's, she's dancing and dressing provocatively just like Brittany Spears did. So I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a little unnerving as far as I was concerned, but uh, yeah, you're you're kind of you're 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 right. You're right. It, they are dressing more provocatively. I know, as weird as that may seem. <laughs> so children believe that everything that their parents tell them is true. Uh, the mother says to the child, "My child is intelligent, handsome, and funny." And of course, the child thinks, "Oh, I must be, you know, smart and and pretty and and and." And funny, so she tries to tell jokes all the time, even though they're not very funny. <laughs> she thinks it's true. Now that's one of the that's the positive thing about parents. That's one of the reasons why parents should never uh, insult their children. But that's not always what happens. The father says he's too awkward to play sports, and the son, of course, assumes that's true. I'm bad at sports, so he never goes into sports. Let me tell you a quick story about Marius, and, and I shouldn't really tell you this story because Marius is a friend of mine. No, Marius thinks he's got skinny legs and he won't, he won't wear shorts, as funny as that is. I know that seems so odd. Practically every Navajo has chicken legs, so I'm just wondering <laughs> why anybody wears shorts on, on this reservation because you have chicken legs. Marius has chicken legs. Don't tell him I said he just called me. He just called me before I came to class. He's funny. See if he's got chicken legs. No, I'm just kidding. He stopped wearing shorts. Yeah, he does wear shorts. He wore shorts over to my house the other day, and I didn't. I didn't point at him. Go, oh, chicken legs. <laughs> <laughs> the mother says, "No one will love you unless you are thin and beautiful." Of course, he grew up uh, off the reservation, so maybe that had something to do with it. Uh, the mother says, no one will love you unless you are thin and beautiful. So the daughter says, that's true, I must lose weight and wear lots of makeup to cover my many flaws. <laughs> she is pretty, isn't she? <laughs> she has lots of makeup on. <laughs> I think she messed up her lips. <laughs> anyway, okay, so the daughter reacts to what the mother says. The parents say, people not, uh, not like us can't be trusted. Uh, and, of course, the children think, well, that's true. People who are different are dangerous. And, of course, sometimes they're taught this. Uh, their parents say this. Sometimes it's, it's uh, the social organizations that they belong to. 
Uh, they belong to a, not a white supremacist uh, group, but whatever the group may happen to be. Um, you know, if you guys don't like Bilaganas because your parents told you that Bilaganas are all thieves and and uh, not not very generous, then uh, potentially you'll have that that idea and you'll believe it, uh, uh, you know, all all your lives. <clears throat> so that's how pre that's where prejudice comes from. It comes from our parents. I was lucky. My parents uh, grew up with uh, with everybody, and because of that, my mother was a nurse, my dad was a banker, but he uh, uh, grew. He had uh, uh, in his high school. They had African Americans in his high school. It was it was an integrated situation, and the valedictorian of his high school class uh, was black, and so he he had very positive. Uh, feelings of, about African Americans, and because of that, uh, he had no problem at all with them, uh, growing up. And of course, they they didn't tell us that they were different, so we didn't know that they were different from us. So I've always assumed that they were the same as we were. I've always assumed that everybody was the same, because that's I wasn't told anything different by my parents. A lot of people are told, you know, you have to be careful of this guy, you have to be careful of that guy. My uh, wife uh, grew up in the military, uh, and of course in the military everybody's the same, uh, but when they were down in Tucson, they were stationed at davis Monthan. Uh they were told to be, uh, she, she was told to be wary of Hispanics, and so she uh, grew up being afraid of Hispanic people, as weird as that may seem. Uh, but uh, it's the only uh, really curious prejudice that she uh, grew up with. Uh, she didn't. She wasn't prejudiced. Uh, she was from Georgia uh, in the segregated times, but she didn't grow up uh, with a prejudice against African Americans. Uh, but she was told to be wary of, of Hispanics uh, when they lived in Tucson. Uh, so she developed that that uh, uh, prejudice. Uh, as she got older, of course, she, she lost it. Uh, but she used to talk about it from time to time, the fact that she was told uh, that she needed to be uh, afraid of Hispanics, as strange as that may seem, in Tucson. Uh, parents, you are worthless and you will never amount to anything. And of course, the child thinks that's true, why even try? And of course, then they become a homeless lady with two dogs and uh, dreadlocks. Oh, no, that's just dirty hair. <laughs> she's got some pretty nasty hair. Anyway, so she's worthless. Uh, you know, she's living up to her, uh, to uh, being worthless. Way to go. Culture strongly influences words used to describe someone's personality, and this is why political correctness is important. Uh, minority cultures will, cultures will sometimes accept the dominant culture's view of themselves as true, and use that definition to evaluate themselves. And this is just kind of a joke. My Indian name is Drinks Like Fish. My Indian name is Crawling Drunk, as stupid as that may seem. So there are those people out there who believe uh, that American Indians are all drunks, uh, they're all drug addicts, they're whatever. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know these, I'm not exactly sure what, uh, what these prejudices are. Uh, but the reality, of course, is, is obviously something different. Uh, we were looking at uh, the people uh, on the northern plains. Uh, they drink a lot more than you guys do down here. That's why I keep saying, you know, your alcoholism isn't nearly what, what I saw up in, up in Montana and uh, Washington State. Um, and uh, so we were looking at this, and one of the things we discovered was Yes, the people on the Northern Plains drink more than any other uh, 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 native group in the United States. People on the Northern Plains, they, they have a lot more alcoholics up there. But the reality is, if you look at all the people drinking uh, in Montana, uh, the, pe the white people that live in Montana drink a lot more than the, the uh, Indians drink up in, up in Montana. As strange as that may seem. It's not that strange. White people are professional drinkers. You got to remember, you guys have been doing this for 400 years, and white people have been doing this for 4,000 years. So they're better at it than anybody else is. Okay, just something that you need to remember. Uh, anyway, so when the dominant culture says something about somebody, you know, all African Americans are lazy, uh, 
uh, all American, all, all uh, Indians are drunks, uh, Hispanics are, I don't know what they say about Hispanics. They're dangerous, I guess. I guess they're dangerous. <laughs> anyway, Asian people are all smart. Uh, if we want to talk about mathematics, who does math the best? <clears throat> Tokyo Dreams. Who does? Tokyo Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, it's Asians are the best at, at doing math. And for some reason, uh, a lot of American Indians don't think they can do math at all. Um, it's genetic. Uh, we, and unfortunately, we got into this idea that all of this is genetically induced, uh, that American Indians can't do math because of genes. Uh, American Indians are drunks because of genes. It's your genes that make you an alcoholic, which is, you have to drink that be an alcoholic, but that's a little, a little different. Uh, anyway, and, and we tried to prove these stereotypes. Uh, once upon a time there was a, uh, a um, uh, scientist that lived in Germany. He was trying to prove, I'm sorry, he lived in France. And he was trying to prove that the French were the most evolved people in the world. So he started measuring people's brains. He started, not their, he didn't take their brains out and measure their brains. What he did was measure their skulls. Uh, because he was trying to prove that uh, the French skull was superior to all other skulls. So he did. He measured French skulls, he measured English skulls, he measured, measured German skulls, he measured African skulls from all different, uh, Egyptian skulls, American Indian skulls. He was trying to prove that the French, French were the most evolved people in, on earth that they were the smartest people on earth because, you know, he was French. So that was what he was trying to prove. Guess what he proved? Who had the biggest heads? Who were the smartest people on earth? Who were the most evolved people on earth? Turned out that the Africans had the smallest heads. The ones that lived in the Sahara Desert were the dumbest people on earth. They had the smallest heads. Who were the smartest people? Who had the biggest heads? Was it the French? Was it the Germans? If you know anything about baseball, there's a, the uh, coach of the San Francisco Giants has the biggest head of anybody that's ever been in baseball. Bruce Bochy was, is the guy's name. He's got this huge melon. I mean, it's like, it's like a, a bowling ball on top of his shoulder. <laughs> is, he really, is he really that smart? <laughs> So who was the smartest, who, who had the biggest heads? Any guesses? Was it the Cherokee? Was it the South Americans, the Patagonians? Who had the biggest heads? Any guesses? Native Americans? Well, they were indigenous, but they weren't, oh, I guess you can call them Native Americans. Sure, it was Eskimos. I know, those guys that live way up in the cold. That doesn't seem very smart to me. It's really cold up there, okay? I don't like the cold at that much, that I would live you know, where it's perpetually icy. That doesn't seem very smart at all to me. I would have thought Samoans would have had bigger heads. I'm sorry? I would have thought Samoans would have had bigger heads. Uh, nope, nope, see Eskimos, they're number one. Okay, so then he decided, well, maybe that was an inaccurate. So he started measuring forearms. And if your forearm, is short like a, or long like a gorilla's, then you're not as evolved. But if you have a short forearm, you're more evolved than everybody else. So he started measuring forearms all over the world. Guess who had the most evolved forearms? Who is the most evolved people in, on the earth? Once again, you remember those guys with the really small heads that lived in the Sahara <laughs> Desert? They had the longest forearms. I know. These are the least evolved people. So who is the most evolved? Was it the French again? It wasn't the French ever, the first time. Who, guess who it was? Asian. Because they're smarter than everybody else? <laughs> Turned out to be the Eskimos again. So it must be smart to live in really, really cold places. Is that, is that what made their heads so big and their arms so short? My poor wife. My wife has a bigger head than I do. Okay. We want to talk about evolution. When I went into the service, they, they were hang, handing out hats. And, of course, 
you know, you put on a hat, you try a, you, know, you, you try an eight, you try a seven and a half, you try a seven. And here, I, they just keep moving me down the line, moving me down the line, moving me down the line. They just shaved our heads. This was during the Vietnam War when everybody had long hair. So they just shaved our heads, and here they just keep moving me down the line, moving me down the line. Went all the way to the end. I have the smallest head, the smallest hat that they had was a six and seven eighths, and that's the size. It was a little, a little bit big, okay? <laughs> but I put it on anyway. So I have the smallest head of anybody in the Air Force. One of the smallest heads of anybody in the Air Force. So does that make me stupid because I'm a pinhead? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why are the Eskimos so damn smart? I don't remember the Eskimos coming up with Einstein's theory. The, I don't think Einstein was an Eskimo, was he? So why are they so smart? What makes their heads so big and their arms so short? Diet? Cold? Uh, cold. It's the cold. If you're a long-armed, small-headed guy up in Alaska, you freeze to death. But if you, can, if, if you can concentrate all your heat with your short little arms and your big, little, your big head, then you survive. So they were the only ones that survived up there because of the cold. Because all of their, you know, they're like a ball. Right? All their heat was concentrated, so they were okay. As interesting, strange, and bizarre as that is. So what does it have to do with? A lot of it has to do with genetics. And a lot of it has to do with the environment that you grow up in. It doesn't have anything to do with it. I can't even remember why I started this conversation. <laughs> uh, so just because you're different doesn't make you different. Well, if you want to talk about different people, how about Jersey Shore? They're, they're some weird guys. Did anybody ever watch Jersey Shore with, what's her name? Jay Wong. <laughs> Jay Wild <laughs> and the situation and Snooky. Snooky, Snooky, that's that's this one right there. Snooky. Okay, these guys were Italian, right? They weren't just Italian, they were Sicilian, who were darker, a little bit darker complexion than everybody else. And they were they were hooked on muscles and and beauty products and hairspray. Hairspray, I guess. And here was Snooky, of course. Snooky. Um, the interesting thing about Snooky is that she's not from New Jersey. Did you guys know that she's not yeah, from she's New from like Guatemala or something like that. She's from Peru, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. She's one of the, the indigenous people of Peru. The indigenous people of, from Peru are uh, Quichua. Quichua, they speak, that's their language. She's only like four foot eight. She's tiny little. She's I know, but she... Try to be just like all them Sicilian people. Which was kind of interesting. <clears throat> and of course, the situation, the guy in the back. These guys were bodybuilders and they took steroids and all kinds of interesting things. The constructivist perspective helps practitioners remember that their view of the world may be different from their client's view of the world. This is one of the things that you've got to remember. So if my brother went in to see the VA, which he won't go in to see the VA, he's afraid that they'll start treating him for his PTSD. But he won't go. <clears throat> But his view of the world is completely different than mine. I would never own a gun. I figure if I own a gun, then I'm more likely to, that somebody's more likely to shoot me. If I, if I pull out a gun, somebody's more likely to shoot me. That's my theory. I've never owned a gun. <clears throat> the practitioner needs to remember, but I, I live in a different world than he does. And his world, he's, his world is a lot more dangerous than mine is. He was out, he was uh, served in combat for 13 months. Uh, they, were under a, they were under attack from uh, the, VA, the NBA and the Viet Cong, not daily, but on a fairly continuous basis. So his world is a lot more paranoid than mine was. Uh, if I flew into a combat zone, I flew into a combat zone, and I flew out of a combat zone fairly readily. I was shot at a lot, but uh, I, obviously I was never hit. When he was shot at, he, was, he had to sit there. I was usually flying in a helicopter. So the bullets were... You could see him coming, and you could see him missing. <laughs> but his, his, he was in a stable position. So if he saw the rounds coming in, he could see them coming right at him. And he couldn't do anything. He couldn't move. He didn't move. Anyway, 
So his, his reality is completely different than mine is. I have two other brothers that were in Vietnam, and they both had different experiences. One was in Army Intelligence. What a joke. <laughs> no offense to the Army. I'm no, right. intelligence, yeah. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a practitioner needs to remember to work within the client's view of reality. It's not your view of reality, it's their view of reality. So you have to figure out what that is in order to, for you to help them. Because their reality may be, may be, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Their reality may be uh, that, whoops, sorry, that. That may be their reality. And if you were never abused as a child, then you, it's, your reality is not gonna be anywhere close to their reality. So you need to, to deal with their reality. You've gotta deal with what their problem is. <clears throat> Their problem may, oh jeez, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, yeah. You're, this, may, this may be their reality. <laughs> uh, this may be their reality. They were, they were always told they're not good enough. This may be their reality. And you have to deal with their reality, not yours. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I told you about the, uh, the social workers, the white social workers going down south and working with the African Americans in, in the south. Their reality wasn't anything like what the, the, the uh, southern individual, the, the African Americans' uh, reality was. <clears throat> because they had never experienced anything like that. And they needed to learn it in order for them to help the people that they were dealing with. Uh, homeless. If you've never been homeless, then your reality is completely different than theirs. You would never. I've got. I got a pocket full of cash right now. I'm never without money. Usually, I'm never without money because I'm afraid something's going to happen. This person is never with money. Uh, if you're poor, then and you get money. What happens next? You spend it, of course. You spend it right away because it might go away really fast. Uh, if you have money and you're not used to having money, you usually get you usually get rid of it really fast. If somebody knows you've got money, they come and try to borrow it from you. That's the way out. That happens to you too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the situation. Uh, when an individual family or group becomes aware of a construct that is unsatisfying or unsatisfying or limiting, the individual can develop another meaning for events or experiences and begin to realize change is possible. And this is one of the things that we have to, to explain to our clients. Change is possible. You have to go. Okay. See you later. Okay. Wednesday, I guess. Uh, and this is one of the things that you have to explain to your, your clients. It's possible to change. And that usually, if you can convince them of that, and a lot of times they'll change on their own. It's not your job to change them. They have to change on their own. You can't change them. They have to do it themselves. But if you can convince them that that's a possibility, then it potentially will happen. And sometimes that's all you need to do. Well, if you don't like living on the streets, why don't you... Why don't you get a job? Well, my parents always told me I was worthless. And I couldn't do anything. Sure you can. And maybe, and of course, they have to change in their own mind before, some, before a change is going to take place. But sometimes all you have to do is tell them that things can change. The idea, of course, the, the idea is better if it comes from the client. That change can happen. But you need to uh, plant that seed that, that it's possible to change. They don't have to be the same person that they were before. <clears throat> now that can be a problem, especially if you're changing somebody's culture. Uh, somebody's suffering because they're going to a church that teaches them that they are sinful. And that uh, unless they do select things or, or have so many children, that they're, they're worthless. Well, sometimes you have to... <clears throat> you can't tell somebody to change churches. But you mean like the core values? The core values of the church, exactly. And that happens. Uh, Westboro Baptist, they're the ones that uh, think that uh, the United States um, is 
there's something wrong with the United States because we have not controlled homosexuality. We haven't destroyed homosexuality. We support homosexuality. So they, they, they're the ones that uh, go, excuse me, go to uh, soldiers' funerals and protest against the soldier. They'll say things like IEDs, God, God made IEDs, and, and uh, you, you need to die. Well, I mean, that's what they say. As stupid as that sounds. <clears throat> so how do you get out of that church? How do you leave that church? Well, you can't force somebody to leave uh, a, religious, uh, a religious structure. You know. if, if it's being destructive to them, and that's part of their pathology, you still can't tell them that it's wrong because it's their their uh, belief system, and you can't change it, and that's okay. Of course, sometimes a practitioner <clears throat> will have to work with pair bond structures that have very different individual constructs because this is the way you and your wife, uh, your your significant other function uh, doesn't mean that everybody functions in the same way. In some households. Uh, uh, some households are matrilineal, some are patrilineal, some there it's more an equality situation where both husband and wife make the decisions. But there are some households where only the man makes a decision. Uh, and of course religious structures were this way. Christianity started out as a male dominated uh, religion. Uh, and to this day if you, and this is one of the things that you may come across, if you get into a situation where you're counseling a Baptist, uh, whether it's the Baptist male or the Baptist female, uh, the male's always in charge. <clears throat> uh, the Baptist church will not allow females to proselytize, to preach to males. Females can only preach to other females. So the male can preach to everybody, but the female can only preach to other females. She can't preach to males. That's the way the religious structure works as weird as that may seem. So the man is always in charge in all situations. That's the way they read the Bible, <clears throat> as interesting as that is. Uh, the Muslim culture. In the Muslim culture, the man is always in charge. The female is almost a second-class a second class citizen. If there is a male child, then the, that male child is a first-class citizen, and his mother is a second-class citizen. That's the way it works. That's why you saw what you saw in Iraq and Afghanistan. <clears throat> Evidently, it's worse in Pakistan. You were in Pakistan, too. You went to Pakistan. Yeah, yeah it's worse in Pakistan. Well, uh, that, I'm sorry. I've actually witnessed a, a stoning. Oh. Yeah, how do you, what do you do when that, a situation like that happens? Well, I guess it was... Uh, Adultery, was that? Yeah, and they covered her in uh, a sheet. And the whole village is stoned. She did she die? Yeah. Yeah. Even the kids are all rough. Everybody. Uh, <clears throat> different structure, different different belief system. I know. Tough. But you're gonna beat somebody to death just because they had sex with the wrong guy? Come on. Right. Prostitution obviously is a stone. She's stone. married too. So of course she's a big is. thing over there, so. And of course, they marry. A lot of times, you marry uh, somebody when you're very, very young. You're 12, 13, 14 years old, and you don't have a choice. It's, there is no arrangements. They're all arrangements. A husband may believe that a wife should stay home and raise the children. Uh, when I first started in counseling uh, back in the 70s, this was the major issue uh, in the United States, uh, where whether the wife could work outside the home. It seems like a silly thing to even think about these days, uh, but at that time, this was the argument. This was the massive argument that we were dealing with, and we dealt with this topic more than any other topic, more than depression, more than anxiety. It had to do with the woman wanting to work outside the home and the husband not wanting the woman to work outside the home. I told you that my mother was a registered nurse. My dad was a banker. Um, <clears throat> my mother worked as a nurse. And she had children. And of course, there were some people in the community that thought that that was sinful, that that was evil, that my mother, there was something wrong with my mother. Obviously, there's something wrong with my mother. She wasn't doing what everybody else was doing. Okay, 
So her social experience was completely different than everybody else's. And she was condemned for her wanting to do what? Wanting to be a nurse. Today that would that would be seen as, as ridiculous. But in, in the 50s, in the, in the early 50s, uh, that was seen as normal. And my mother was very abnormal. Divorce was impossible uh, in the 1950s. Now it's commonplace. I've been divorced twice myself. I know. Third time's a charm. <laughs> so far. <laughs> uh, she called me this morning. She didn't call me because she wanted to talk to me. She called me because she was trying to dial somebody else's number, and she hit my number. <laughs> and she told me that. My heart's not broken. I, I didn't start crying. I'm crying now, but I wasn't, I wasn't crying then. I know it was really kind of tragic. We had a conversation. I tried to call her this weekend. She wasn't answering her telephone to me. I'll be all right. Systems theory. <laughs> Systems theory takes uh, into account the entire system with which an individual interacts. And this is known as systems theory. We're going to start talking about the family systems theory. A system is seen as a complex entity within which interactions are as, as important as the individuals. Now one of the things that you have to remember is that uh, when we talk about family, when I talk about family and I'm talking about my family, I'm talking about my mom, my dad, I didn't have any grandparents. They were all dead before I was born. Uh, but my aunts and uncles, and that's about it. And maybe my cousins. That's about as, as intricate as my family becomes. But your families are huge. I mean, you've got the whole clan system. Uh, your people, people in your clan are your brothers and sisters. So it's your, your idea of family is completely different than mine. This is just a random question, but like back in the 50s and in those days, did women have children at a younger age? Uh, like well, that's an interesting question. They didn't have babies out of wedlock. If you did, you gave the baby up for adoptions. But a lot of women, most women got married right out of high school. So you got married at 18. You started having babies almost right away. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. There were, there were no 14-year-olds having babies. Uh, very rare. <clears throat> If somebody got pregnant, there was no abortion. So if somebody got pregnant, they had to have they had the baby, and then they gave the baby up for adoption. Orphanages, there were orphanages all around the uh, country. Um, 